of Philippians chapter 4. And Philippians chapter 4, we get to a place where Paul is thanking the Philippian church for their generosity towards him. That he's explaining to them that, listen, in my ministry, there were no other churches that supported me, but you supported me. And not just once, but twice. And so what we're going to, as we look in to the book of Philippians and we look at the Philippian church, we're going to find uh, something that they had. They had what I call an abundance mindset, an abundance mentality. Many of us are living in a scarcity mentality, and this is the way that I illustrate this, is that people look at our world and our, their situation, and they go, man, there is one pie, and I've got to fight for my slice of the pie. But in God's economy, there's this oven, and there's a baker, and he's making unlimited pies, and there's this abundance of pies for us. So when you live in this idea that God owns it all, created it all, he's the supplier of all of our needs, that he owns uh, cattle on a thousand hill, that when you understand who God is and this generous, loving, abundant God, you'll begin to live out of that. And that's exactly where the Philippians were living, out of this abundance mindset. Now, in, in verse 15, I'm going to read verses 15 through 19. He says, moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except only you, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And so Paul starts out saying, listen, thank you for your gifts. Thank you for partnering with me in the gospel through your generosity and through your financial gifts. And let me say this, is that we can be generous and we can donate, we can give to all kinds of organizations. There's all kinds of humanitarian organizations that we can donate money to. There's all, all kind of political movements that we can give our money to. But let me make this argument that there's no greater organization on this earth than the, the family and the church of God and his kingdom that, that that alone is the most important thing that we can give our finances and our time and our resources to. Why? Because the things that we, we give to on this earth, maybe they just last here. But when we give to God's kingdom, they last for an eternity. And so what I want to do is I want to give you five ways today from these verses of how we can give to the Lord's work. How we can invest into eternity. And the first one is this, is give generously. If you're taking notes, give generously. He says, for even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. It's like these guys are serial givers. They give on a regular basis. And so generosity was a way of life for the Philippian church. You sent me more than once. They gave continuously. Um, they were faithful partners in the gospel. And as a result of that, they were generous. You know, I, uh, one of my favorite scriptures about giving comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. And Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. And he says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. And so if you're not, you're not putting that much seed out, you're not going to get a crop. You're not going to get an investment, a return on your investment. But if you're giving a lot, you're going to have bigger. So then verse 7 says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. 
So he doesn't want you to be reluctant and like, oh, I'm giving this, but my heart's not really into it, or I'm giving out of obligation, or I'm giving because someone expects me to do it. He doesn't want your motive. He wants motive to be like, I'll give, but I'll just do it because I'm supposed to do it. He goes, no, no, no. I want you to give out of a heart that has been changed by the gospel, a heart that's been changed by Jesus Christ. And so when the the word there in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, cheerful, is the Greek word in the original. It's hilaros. Hilaros. Do you guys know of an English word that sounds like hilaros? What is the English word we get? Hilarious. And so he's, he's basically saying, uh, when you give, be so cheerful, so excited, you're actually laughing about it. You're like, I, I get to give. I can't believe this, that there's a God that loves me, and he owns everything, and everything I have is his, and I get to give a little bit of that. And there's this joyful attitude in giving. Now, some of you are saying, Billy, wait a second. Are you telling me to be cheerful? I just lost my job. Uh, I'm trying to make ends meet. I don't even know where the next rent check is coming from. Uh, are you trying to tell me in an economy like this that I can just be joyful and cheerful when I give and I'm generous? Yes. Why? Because uh, no matter what, th Paul's talking about circumstances here, right? No matter what your circumstances, throughout the whole book of Philippians, we can still be obedient. We can still follow God and trust him and know that he's going to take care of us. And when we're giving, we're, we're doing what God has created us to do. You see, we're created, the Bible says, in the image of God. God, by nature, is a generous God. He's a giving God. And so when we give, we're, we're representing our creator well. And we're experiencing this. In fact, this is what Billy Graham said. He said, God has given us two hands, one to receive with and the other to give with. I really like that. He's given us two hands. And so, yeah, there's times when we receive. There's times when we, we experience God's blessing. And then God blesses us so that we can be a blessing to others. So the first thing he says is if you want to give to the Lord's work, you give generously. The second thing he says, the second way to do this is to give expectantly, to give expectantly, Philippians 4.17. Paul's saying this, not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. So what he's saying is that, hey, listen, it's not that I'm like over here going, hey, I need your gifts, I want your gifts, I'm gonna, I'm gonna manipulate you to somehow support me. He's not, no, no, no. It's what will be accredited to your account. You're investing in eternity when you invest in the gospel. You're investing in eternity. Um, the, the Circle the word in your notes there in your Bible more or underline it. More. The Greek word is pleonazo. It's where we get that word plenty. Um, it literally means a super abundance or increase. He says, you will increase if you are generous. What do we increase in? The first thing is you'll increase your character. You'll become more like Christ when you're generous. And so if, if anything, if you don't get any increase at all, you're becoming more like Jesus and your character is being built. But you'll also experience eternal rewards. That there's this 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 kind of concept from Revelation chapter 4 that there's these crowns in heaven and we're kind of putting more jewels in our crown. But you know what the Bible says? That when we get to heaven, we're going to lay all those crowns da down at the feet of Jesus anyways because that's what we were created to do is worship him. Jesus put it this way when, it, when he talks about, he says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so he says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. We live, 
essentially in a materialistic age. And we're trying to buy the most expensive things and we, we value prestige and we value how people view us and we spend a lot of money on things that we don't need with money we really don't have. And what we find ourselves is in a world of hurt. And so Jesus says, I want you to shift your perspective. I want you to then invest in things that will never fade away. And investing in eternity is the way to do that. You know, when you invest and you partner with churches like the Bridge and the Gospel and other churches and ministries, do you know what happens? You're investing in people's lives being changed. Now, Jesus is the one that changes lives. Don't get me wrong. He's the one that changes the heart and changes the lives. But he uses our resources and he uses our generosity in the process. You know, I'll tell you this. For me, um, when I was 19 years old, uh, our church was going to a, a big men's event called Promise Keepers. Some of you have heard about it. But in the mid-90s, uh, we used to fill Oakland Coliseum. Like there was 50,000 men that would, would go into this Coliseum and there would be speakers there. And so I remember our church was going on a trip. And I go, I'm 19 years old. I'm a brand new Christian. Like I want to go on this trip. And so, but I also wanted my dad to go on the trip. And he had just started kind of coming to church with me and checking out the whole Christianity thing. And so I remember uh, buying my dad a ticket to the Promise Keepers event. I was 19 years old, I spent $55, and I bought his ticket without asking him. I went to ask him, hey, do you want to go to this event with me? And his answer was, no, nah, I'm not really. And so I did what a, a good Christian son would do. I made my dad feel guilty for once. <laughs> and I said, Dad, I, I already bought the ticket, so if you don't go, I'm out $55. And he goes, okay. I'll go. <laughs> well, he went, and uh, there was a speaker there named Raul Reese. I'll never forget his name, a Calvary Chapel uh, pastor down south. And he preached the gospel, and then he invited anyone that wanted to give their life to Jesus, to put their faith in him, to walk down onto the field of the Oakland Coliseum. And I just remember my dad getting up out of his seat and walking down to the Oakland Coliseum, and I was so filled with joy. And I'll say this, that was the best investment of $55 that I ever gave. <laughs> you see, when we invest in the gospel, it, it lasts for an eternity. The fact that your, your giving and your generosity could, could help somebody understand an eternal truth and you'll get to see them in eternity forever. You get to spend, you spend your life with them in heaven. That's, that's what he's talking about here. He's talking about giving expectantly that God's going to work and God's going to do something amazing through that. The third way that we can give towards God's work is, is to give sacrificially. To give sacrificially. He goes on to Philippians chapter 4, verse 18. I have received full payment... And have more than enough, right? Paul, remember earlier in his, the message on contentment? He knew what it was like to eat and not have enough food, to be clothed and not clothed. Like he knew what it was like to have enough and not have enough. But he says this, I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. I love this picture of a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice. You know, in the Old Testament, uh, when the priest would, would make a sacrifice, it, was to, be, it would, was to be a fragrant offering and pleasing to God. And you know how it became pleasing? It's when that, that person that was offering the sacrifice would give what we call an unblemished lamb, an unblemished animal. We think, Lord, we're going to make a sacrifice to God, so we're going to, we're going to go into our livestock and we're going to find the one that can't, you know, the, the one that can't walk and the, the one that's got blemishes and we're going to find the, and then we're going to give God what, like, is, doesn't really have much value to us. And we think that that's going to honor God. No, in the Old Testament, God was said, no, find 
your finest livestock, your unblemished lamb, your, the, the, that thing that's most valuable to you. And now I want you to bring that to me with all of your heart. And the Bible says that's a sweet, sweet smelling aroma. It's a fragrance. It's an acceptable sacrifice. You see, when we give to God, we want, he wants it to be a sacrifice. He doesn't want it to be totally easy, like, no, nah, just give him our worst. No, God says to give him his, our, our first fruits. What does first fruits mean? It means that we give to him by faith at the beginning of the month, knowing that he's going to supply the rest of the month. It doesn't mean that I'm going to live you know, that 26, 27, 28 days out of the month, and at the end of the month, maybe I'll have enough left over to give to God. That's not faith. Faith is saying, I'm gonna give you my best, I'm gonna give you my first fruits, and I'm gonna trust that you're gonna provide for me. And even if you don't provide for me, I'm gonna do it purely out of obedience because, God, you are worth it, and you are honored through it. And so... <clears throat> So we are to give sacrificially. Uh, there's a great story about this in the Bible in, in Mark chapter 12 where Jesus goes to the temple and there's the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the people that everyone admired and they're there and they're giving um, money and they're throwing money into the, the, the box. You know, they didn't have wooden boxes but they had probably metal things that made noises and so they're there, and they're like announcing it with trumpets. I just picture like a mariachi band right there, like going, hey, these guys, the Pharisees, they're making all, you know, they're giving all this money. And so they're giving a, probably quite a bit of money. And then Jesus is looking over, and there's this widow, and she gives two little pennies. And this is what Jesus said. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything all she had to live on. And I love that, that picture of, here's this woman. She, um, unfortunately, in that particular culture, women didn't have a lot of rights. And, and if she was a widow she would have really been unprotected and had no way to, to make money or provide for herself. And so when you think about the cultural context of this woman giving her last two pennies an honor to God, to praise him, knowing that he was his, her everything, he says, what did, what did Jesus said? She gave more than these Pharisees, these wealthy, rich Pharisees. She gave more. Why? Because it was about percentages, Right? She gave, she gave higher percentage compared to these Pharisees. She gave more of a sacrifice, but most importantly, in that moment, she was giving her heart to God. And that's really what God wants in our giving. He wants our hearts. He's not looking for just money. It's like not, God's not up there going, oh, I need your money. No, no, no. He's looking for a heart that's been changed and is devoted to him. I like what A.B. Simpson said. He's the founder of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. He said, the test of your character is what it takes to stop you from giving. What's the, that, that's the test of your character. Is there a point in your life where you go, no, 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 I'm not going to give anymore. Just like this, this widow. She says, and many people, we have that justification. We say, you know what? Um, I lost my job. I can't give. I can't be generous. I can't help. I, I, you know, we, we look to our circumstances and A.B. Simpson's saying, well, that's the test of your character. And it really is. I think that money is one of those things that people don't want. Hey, don't talk about my money. Hey, that, that's my bank account, and that's, that's mine. I don't want you telling me what to do. And no one's telling you what to do, and God's not even going to force you to do anything. But when it comes to loving him, being obedient, growing in Christ-like character, he's called us to be generous and to give. And so we have to respond to that and give sacrificially. The fourth way that we can give to God's work is to give securely. <clears throat> give securely. Philippians 4.19, this is one of the best verses in Philippians. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. My God will meet 
We've got this abundant, loving God. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, God's not going to meet all of your wants. Now, some of you are like, oh, man, but I want this. And he might, he might meet some of those wants, but he's going to meet your needs. What do you need? And he knows what you need better than you know. And so as you seek after him and as he provides, you, provides for you, he's going to take care of you. And so the riches of his glory, God's provision is abundant and based on his, his glorious riches for surpassing our needs. He can take care of us. He will meet, the, the word there in the original language means to fill up. It means to, to bring top to the brim, to fill up my needs. That's what it means. And he says, he will meet your needs. Now the early church knew exactly what this was about. Right, the early church in Acts chapter four, we find that uh, people were selling possessions, and then they were taking the money, and they were bringing it to the apostles' feet, kind of like the leaders of the church. And then the apostles were, they were distributing the money according to what people needed. And if you, you think about the early church, they lived in the Roman Empire. They didn't have any rights. Uh, many of people couldn't get jobs if they were Christians. They were persecuted, and they weren't really hugely persecuted at that point, but they were still not looked upon favorably. And so they had a hard time getting jobs. And so many of these people, they needed each other. The church, the body of Christ needed each other to support and help one another when they were in their times of need. And I love that whole Acts chapter 4 because there's this one guy in Acts chapter 4. His name is, um, it's originally Joseph, but uh, they named him Barnabas. And the Bible says in Philippians chapter, or uh, Acts chapter 4, verses 36 and 37. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. He sold real estate that he owned. I mean, this is prime real estate in the Roman Empire, and he takes that money and he brings it to the apostles' feet. Talk about encouragement. We know that Barnabas was known for encouragement. Not only was he financially generous, but he was the only guy that stood by Paul when Paul became a follower of Jesus. Remember, Paul was killing Christians and arresting Christians. And so when Paul became a, a, a believer in Jesus, the other Christians in the area didn't believe Paul made a, a, a real conversion. Like They're like, there's no way this guy could. Barnabas vouched for him and said, no, 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 his faith is real. And so Barnabas was just encouraging all around. But Barnabas knew what it was like to, to, to live in an abundance mindset, that I'm going to be able to give. Why? Because he knew that his father would take care of his needs. You know, I remember um, when we lost everything seven years ago, uh, when we lost all of our material things, it, it just, it, it messes with your mind a little bit. You're like, these are things I, I you know, worked for and bought, and it can just, in a blink of an eye, it's gone. And so it was so cool because Alyssa and I, we really experienced the generosity and the blessing of the church body. And so many people got us gift cards. And so we had like gift cards to all kinds of different places, and it was awesome to have all these gift cards. Uh, but what happened was we would be out in the community, and I remember we were at an event at Coffee Park, and we ran into um, a family, and, and they had uh, five kids, and actually the teacher was my son's former elementary school teacher, and so Alyssa was talking to her, and next thing you know, I look over, and Alyssa's going into our car and getting out gift cards, and she's giving those gift cards to this woman who is in need. And it was so cool. It was like, it was just, it was, it was like a picture of the early church. Like, I've been blessed and now let's, let's bless others. And so she's giving out gift cards. I remember I was at an, another event and a lady was there and she was, she was crying and she was over by the truck, truck I was driving and, and she just starts crying. She's like, I'm so sorry, but I was backing out and I backed into your truck and and she's just going like, and I'm like, did you lose a house too? And she's like, yes, I did. And this is just awful. And I'm so, t I'm so sorry. I don't know what to do. And, and it's like, hold on a second. And so I went into the truck. I got a gift card. And I gave it to her. And she goes, oh, wait a second. I, I was going to give you my insurance. And we we're going to do it. And I'm like, you know what? 
don't even worry about that, that little bump on the, on the bumper. I'm like, I'm borrowing that truck. It's not even mine anyway, so. <laughs> it's so bad, but it's true. And, uh, but the point was is that we didn't need to put more stress on her. We needed to just help her out. And so uh, I, I love that we can, we can give securely. And here's the reason why. We can give securely because we serve a God who loves us and is going to take care of us. And our security is not found in our resources and in our money. Our security is found in God. And when your security is found in God, then nothing else can take that security away because God is foundational, he's unchanging, and he loves you. And so I I love what... um, Randy Alcorn said, he said, God prospers me not to raise my, my standard of living, but to raise my standard of giving. And I really like that. Not to raise my standard of living, but to raise my standard of giving. Number five is to give worshipfully. To give worshipfully. Philippians 4.20, then Paul says, to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. So in the context of He's talking about the Philippian church meeting his needs. Then he breaks out into a praise towards God. He breaks out into worship towards God. And he says, to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. You know, the ultimate goal of giving and generosity is to bring glory to God's name. End of story. That when we give, we are worshiping him with our resources. There's no better story then in, in Mark chapter 14, the Bible says that uh, Jesus is at the, the home of this guy named Simon, and he's eating dinner with him, and he's about to go to the cross. It's pretty close to him going to the cross. And so there's a woman there. The Bible describes her as a sinful woman. A woman comes in, and I'm just going to read the story. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. Now, this woman would have probably had this expensive perfume. It, it, many, you know, as commentators believe that she was a prostitute before she met Jesus and before he changed her life. And so she had this expensive perfume as a result of her past life. And so the Bible says, she broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. And it was interesting because the disciples got upset with this. And they go, they, they're kind of mad and they're going, well, couldn't this, this uh, perfume been sold and it could have helped, you know, people that were poor and stuff? The Bible says <clears throat> this perfume was as expensive as a year's worth of salary. So we're not just talking like a a little $20 bottle of perfume from Ross. (laughs) That's not where I get my wife's perfume. Don't don't tell her that. (laughs) But we're talking about a year's worth of salary. And she breaks the jar and she pours it over Jesus in an act of worship to get his body prepared for his burial. And Jesus said that wherever the gospel is preached, this woman's story is going to be told along with it. Can you imagine? She decided not to do that. Here's the thing. She couldn't help but do it because she had been forgiven. Her whole life, her past life had been erased. She had now been redeemed. She had value She understood that God loved her, and now she had a purpose and a plan for her life that was defined by God. And her whole, everything, her whole mindset, everything now was not scarcity and how am I going to make money. It's how now can I worship my Savior? And she sets us an example. And so what would, I'm going to ask you this, what would it take Like, what's the jar in your life that God would say, I want you to break that jar in order to worship me? What is he calling you to do? For some of you, maybe this idea of giving is so foreign. You're like, I I can't even think about giving. I've got all this stuff. It's a a faith thing, and so God is calling you to give at some level. 
for some of you that are not giving, or, or for some of you that are giving, maybe he's calling you to take that next step of faith, of generosity, to go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give. And, and this is why we give, guys. Because, listen, you might hear a message, you might be inspired by this and say, I want to start giving, and that's, that's awesome. God's working in your heart. But I want you to be reminded, you can never outgive God. You see, God gave everything. When he gave his one and only son, Jesus, for you, he gave everything so that you can have a relationship with him. And I, I love this verse in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. It says, and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. You see, we're called to, to sacrifice for him, but he sacrificed his own son so we can have a relationship with him. He gave his all for you. And so he's calling you to give your heart to him. He's calling you to give your heart to him. And so maybe today, that's what you need to do. You just need to say, Lord, I give you my heart. I trust you with every area of my life. I'm just saying, Lord, I, I trust you with my finances. I trust you with my relationships. I trust you with my future. God, even though I, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense for me to be generous at this point, I'm going to put my faith in you and I'm going to be generous and watch what God does. Like I said, Alyssa and I have been in situations where it would have been very easy to stop giving. It would have, been, it would have made sense for us. And we've always looked at each other and said, God has been so faithful to us. How could we not give to him? He's been so faithful us in giving his son Jesus, but he's been faithful to us over and over and over in our lives. And we've seen miracles and and money come out of places. We're like, where did that come from? And just play times when we're like, didn't know how we're going to make it. And God provided for us. He supplied all of our needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And he'll do the same for you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you gave everything when you gave your one and only son. You are such a generous God, Lord, and we praise you. I pray right now if there's someone who's never received that gift, that generosity that you gave, that in their hearts right now they would say, Lord Jesus, I trust you. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, and I, and I receive that gift of forgiveness right now. Father, in a, in a message like this, Lord, um, your spirit is working. We acknowledge your spirit is moving. And so, Lord, I pray that you would touch each individual heart. Lord, as they, they give their hearts to you, God, that they would be listening to hear, God, what are you saying? What are you saying to them right now? And that, Lord, you would give them the courage they need to be obedient and the courage they need to step out in faith. And so, Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your provision, that you are a God we can find all of our security in, and we worship you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.